Hi, Jogan. Thanks for joining me, friend. It's a pleasure. Been really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, I've, let's see. Yeah, maybe to introduce you a little bit, I, I heard about you from my friend Emily some time ago, and she said that you two have very similar stories. And then uh, my friend Dan recently was working with you with some of your offerings, and he was like, you got to have Jogan on. So here we are. Uh, it's a real treat to meet you and delighted oh to hear goodness. more about your life and offerings. Um, so maybe just to start, could you share your background and life story at whatever length or in whatever way you would like to? Wow, it's such a big question. Um, let's see, I was born uh, in Southern California. Both my parents were teachers. Uh, my family is Jewish, non-religious, that kind of more culturally Jewish. So there really wasn't any strong idea of the divine or religious imposition upon me, which I consider actually quite a gift in encountering the Dharma. I didn't really encounter it so strongly with a background of conditioning. Um, my father passed away when I was seven years old, hmm. which is, I think, a really significant event as far as my spiritual formation. So he died of cancer and that really just devastated my whole family. My mom was widowed at 35. Mm. Mm. Now, I was seven, my sister was 10. And yeah, so how much of that I was able to digest as a little boy is hard to say, but definitely that was part of my coming into, into practice. And my first real deep body deep teaching of impermanence was his death. So that's a, that's a major part of my, my past. We moved to Las Vegas. Um, I don't know, I guess I was five years old, four years old. So I grew up in this interesting place that's both like all this facade and artificial glamour and excitement. But then I lived near Red Rock Canyon and at, a, at that time, there's a lot of undeveloped desert. So big desert skies and expanse was something I came to love from a young age, which I think maybe my first taste of meditation, just being out there with that big desert sky. Mm. Um, boy, all the years in between there are a blur in some ways. Um, I was into martial arts when I was when I was young. I think that was the first place I meditated. I had a Taekwondo teacher who was in the Korean War and learned meditation from Korean monks. And so that was the first time I got a taste of that. And I think that was also an important, significant thing. And also a little bit of discipline and, and the ability to work with a, a teacher in that way. Um, big into music for most of my life. I remember that the first job I had, I made 325 an hour as the guy who gets the carts from the parking lot, the cart boy mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. grocery store. And I immediately spent all $110 of that first paycheck on uh, cassettes at the local record store. So a deep love of music it's been with me my whole life and it's a big part of my my spiritual practice as well sound sound as a dharma gate has been huge uh, i played drum set since i was 17. Um, got introduced to free jazz and spiritual jazz so i consider john coltrane sun ra uh, pharaoh saunders that group of or that genre of jazz musicians as actually my first spiritual teachers because I was so aversive to religion and so pretty non-spiritual, I think. When I started listening to these records, I um, was transported and something came through their music that I think inspired me to be curious about where they were coming from. And so I would look into it further. And for example, Alice Coltrane um, became a nun. She retired from jazz and became a, a sannyasi in the Hindu tradition. And 
So these people that I deeply respected in music being interested in spirituality was a way for me to suspend my um, aversion, basically, and become curious about meditation and mysticism and things like that. I started practicing when I was 17 years old. Um, I, had a, I had a Japanese girlfriend who was my high school sweetheart. I went to Japan and I was in cities like Kyoto with the ancient temples and visited some of those places and was actually more interested in, you know, getting robot toys and going to really cool arcades than mm. Buddhist culture. But I think something happened there visiting those places. But the most important thing was that while I was there, my grandfather passed away suddenly. So he was, he was in his fifties and he was the closest thing I had to, um, like a male mentor in my life at that time. He died suddenly and coming back, I helped my grandmother clean out his study and I ended up inheriting a number of books on Zen and yoga, as well as a very cool new age meditation device that he used, which is goggles and a light device that used binaural beats and light patterns to put you into different states. And so that was really how I got launched into the world of meditation and spirituality. And that, that was going parallel with a phase of psychedelic exploration. And I look at those two events as really crucial. Um, having some openings on psychedelics and then having um, these, this world of teachings that opened to me that I really hadn't encountered at all before. One of the first books I read was The Empty Mirror by a, a Dutchman whose name I can't pronounce properly. But it's the story of this guy who goes to this pretty intense Rinzai monastery in Japan. And it's very austere and he struggles a lot. But something about that really fascinated me. And I felt like some call to experience that. It wasn't long after that, that I found myself at this little Korean Zen center that's right off the strip, which is ironic. I would get off work. I worked at a casino and I would drive five minutes across the expressway and be at this, uh, this Zen center. And that was really the beginning of my, my Dharma career right there. And as soon as I started meditating, I just wanted more. I was just really excited that I found something that felt very much worth putting my energy into. And just through luck or grace, some early experiences gave me confidence that there's really something here. And so I just became kind of a fanatical devourer of all things that I could find at that time, which in the mid nineties was a lot less than now. Um, that coincided with a breakup with um, a girlfriend it coincided with just resurfacing of trauma, which I think was part of the meditation was that I was getting into my body and my heart to the degree that I could actually be in contact with the grief from losing my father. And so that became a mix of both confusion and further fuel. And that just kind of pushed me further into all of these, all of these disciplines and eventually on to, um, monastic training hmm. Hmm. yeah what made you decide to go into monastic training i really tried to do lay practice and pretty good fervor for a teenager and in, in my early 20s but i'm very distractible and at that time especially there was the women and music were such a strong pull that I, I felt that I needed to have some support to really go deeper. And I first explored Zen Mountain Monastery. And this is a time when John Vitalori was, was still teaching and alive. And I had never encountered such inspired, heart-centered, mature people in my whole life. I didn't know there were adults like this. You know, and I, it was the first time I met people who were not so neurotic. And the teaching spoke to me and the vibe, the synergy of the place, the place at that time, and it still might be, 
was just cooking with with vibrant energy and vow power and real enthusiasm and I found the people interesting I found the teachings encouraging and I did my first session up there which was I almost didn't make it um, but glad I did and then after that I got this taste of this deep practice and I went back to lay life and I ended up moving to Portland and it really just haunted me that there was a way I could be using my life that felt profoundly meaningful and, and I didn't have the discipline to replicate or find a version of that as a lay person in my early 20s. Hmm. I did move to Portland. I did meet Chosen and Hogan Roshis who were my root teachers at, at Great Vow and especially Hogan was a very inspiring person. And I kind of had something of that archetypal experience where you meet your teacher, you encounter them and you really know it. And I remember going to private interview with him in the city. I would visit him and I had just initiated spiritual crisis and I didn't know it. I had just kind of tore off the bandages, started to see through some of my fantasies about what life was and who I was going to be. And I was in a lot of pain and I was also really inspired. And I remember two things about him. First thing I remembered was it was the first time I had felt myself in the presence of somebody who had zero judgment. It was palpable, the quality of acceptance in his presence. And so that felt really encouraging and desirable and safe. And the other thing was I asked him what I should do. And he didn't give me advice from a place of I know what's best for you. Mm -hmm. right? Even though I was this pretty disheveled, confused, you know, 22 year old, he really just set me back to my own heart. And that was really encouraging. So it wasn't long after that I undid my Portland life, which hadn't been very well established and moved to Great Vow. Yeah. What was the training there like for you? That's a huge question. Yes. Um, well, there's, there's so many stages that, that we go through, you know, in, in this kind of practice. So I was there about 16 years all in all, wow. especially in the beginning, I found that the rigor was um, hard and my body and emotions had a lot of shock from how much practice I was doing how many of the usual avenues of distraction were taken away. <coughs> but at the same time, I was wildly inspired by doing um, so much practice, being among other young people, people my age who were also passionate about it. Um, the monastery was just getting founded at that time. So this is, I went there in 2003. And so I just felt like something really cool is happening here and I can be a part of the founding of something. And I, uh, I found that really encouraging. I became a kind of fundamentalist practitioner for a good while. I didn't at that time have the ability to culturally contextualize the teachings. So if I read Dogen Zenji or Hakuin Zenji or whoever, and they said, this is how one should practice. I did my sloppy self-centered best to try to practice like that. Mm. So those early years were years of it's never enough. Always got to sit more, got to practice harder. In a way, it was like all of my testosterone and angst went into this ideal notion of how one should practice. But in, I'm, in retrospect, I'm glad I did. And I really, really engaged the training as best I could. We did session every month. Um, we woke up before four o'clock. You know, if you had other responsibilities, it was even even less sleep. Um, we would not only have those week long retreats, but we'd have guest teachers come and lead other retreats. So it wasn't uncommon, especially in the first several years, to do two weeks of retreat a month. So I had all of this fervor, and also I was encountering myself. I was encountering uh, my wounding. I was encountering all of my contradictions, all of my biases and prejudice. And 
especially community life um, was very hard. And I, I don't know that it's ever not, not hard, although learning to navigate that certainly got easier as I let go of my own um, anger and, and righteousness. But that was the thing I didn't like. I loved session, I loved my teachers, didn't like that I lived with all these people who I didn't choose to live with. And of course, that's, that's part of the genius of the Zen style of training is that you don't get to isolate and you're constantly up against your projections and desires and all of the ways we try to manipulate and avoid and all the interpersonal stuff, but in the context of that great fire of awareness that you create together. So there are lots of small stories in there about that, but I kept going with the training. At one point I laughed that a couple years in, I thought, okay, I got enough like understanding. Now I want to see if I'm confident enough to date more freely in Portland. Mm. I thought I got what I wanted from Buddhism. Now maybe I'll be, you know, a more appealing partner. Mm. But the more I thought about what I valued, who I was, who I would be if I went back to Portland, I felt that taking ordination was a more meaningful use of my life. Mm. And people I was inspired by were monks there. And so there was a sense of, yeah, I want to be like my teacher, definitely. And my teachers are ordained. This is the way they chose to express their devotion to the practice. I think at that time, I also believed it was a superior, if not the only way to practice deeply which is fine. I eventually outgrew that, but, um, yeah. So I, the next stage was taking ordination and, and all that entailed the deeper commitment and more renunciation and taking it on as a, a whole different level of identity, the role identity as an ordained person, which was, which is a significant thing. Yeah. What else would be interesting about that? How, how would you describe to your past self before he joined the monastery, what he was signing up for? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I would tell him you are um, signing up for um, encountering um, all that is beautiful and ugly in yourself. And you're signing up for being uh, surprised at how much is beautiful and how much is ugly in yourself. I would tell him that good idea, do this, because to have the affinity and the circumstances, we could even frame it as privilege to be able to do so is so precious because you're going to be grateful on the other side that you put yourself through that. You're signing yourself up for getting entangled in an institution, getting entangled in, in relationships. That's part of what happens. Human beings practice the Dharma, not saints. Saints don't need to practice. Right? So we're all there because we have something to, to learn from each other. Um, you know, what's interesting is a lot of people leave too early from places of training or they leave too late. And I think I was lucky enough that the community is um, loose, not loose, um, open-hearted enough. And I had enough mentors in my life at the time I decided to leave that I didn't stay longer than I should have, mm -hmm. which is not always the case for people in those kind of environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the amount of time was actually was right. So I could tell the previous version of myself that he'll stay just the right amount of time. Mm -hmm. You'll leave exactly when you need to. Beautiful. Yeah. How would you describe, this is another big question here, sorry. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the unfolding of your practice over the time that you were at Great Vow? Oh man, I have no idea. Yes. Well, Yeah, I need more specifics. That's really hard. Well, to start functionally, what would you say the practices were that you did during that time? The practices that I did, yeah. Yes. So um, first arriving did concentration practice. So my teachers felt that to develop concentration is essential. So I did, I did breath meditation. Um, 
alongside that, I did a lot of prostrations and bowing was a part of the way I was working on my sense of pride and, and of letting go of um, things that were difficult to forgive in myself and forgive in others. So I was doing both those. <coughs> uh, eventually a concentration practice, I was moved into listening practice. And I would say my first significant opening was with sound meditation. And having an opening into emptiness is not the end of practice, but it's uh, a new platform from which to practice. And so against my will, I ended up doing koan study mm. for many years, which uh, is a whole topic in itself. Um, very rich, very um, challenging kind of practice. And then whenever I would decide I'm fed up with koan practice and I would just basically tell my teacher, now I'm not going to listen to you, I would be practicing shikantaza, mm. which the way, the flavor of great vow is pretty closely aligned with like Hongzhi's silent illumination. Mm. He wrote a text that was translated as cultivating the empty field. That's a very important text in the great vow family. We chant things from that um, during, on a daily basis. It's a particular flavor of just sitting where it's um, open awareness and shamatha calm abiding combined. Mm. Kind of a shamatha vipassana. Mm. So my practice at that time is I just loved meditation and I would like be the kind of person at the monastery who got finished eating lunch and would go meditate. Mm. And would not socialize and would spend his days off in retreat and that kind of thing. I just, and I really did that both because I thought that was the ideal and I wanted to be the best and better than the other practitioners. And I loved it. And it was really nourishing my heart and um, never let me down. The meditation practice has been one of those things in my life that the energy I've put in has always um, given back in a way that has has deepened my faith and and carried me so yeah that practice and then there's the whole practice of just the interpersonal life and the jobs that we we had to undertake and I, for a couple of years i was the cook at the monastery and so that meant cooking for you know sometimes 40, 50, 60, even 70 people three times a day and planning the meals and running the kitchen as well as keeping the monastic schedule. And my first year of doing that, I got shingles. Mm, wow. Which is a really, it's a skin virus that is very rare for adults to get. Mm. And it only comes out from high stress situations. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's how stressful it was to yes. be in the midst of whatever I was in spiritually anyways and have all of this responsibility. Yes. But I eventually, cooking and running the kitchen taught me what it means to have practice and activity. As not a platitude, but as a real thing. Because I had to, mm -hmm. in order to really make it through those couple of years. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you said you did koan practice against your will, what was, what, what, say more about that. Yeah. Well, I, so something that goes in tandem with this whole thing of going into the Zen monastery is I bought a book called Flight of the Garuda, mm. which is a Dzogchen text. And Dzogchen is a Tibetan Buddhist um, body of practices, if not a tradition in itself. And I loved that flavor of practice and I ate those texts up and I kind of understood what I was doing in Zen through that lens as well as through what I was hearing from like the Soto Zen ancestors or Rinzai teachers. <coughs> and Shikantaza, the main Soto practice of just sitting, has some similarities to that Dzogchen practice. So basically that's what I wanted to do. That's where I found the deepest nourishment. And I think it was because I had an affinity for it. Like I was, there, in some sense, I had the skill and the, the proclivity to do that practice and experience it as a space of freedom pretty early on. Whereas koan practice confronts you with not knowing. It confronts you with how the sense of self is 
um, a barrier that has to be addressed in order for meditation to genuinely liberate. It confronts you in the room with the teacher with, can you spontaneously express or will you fall back on your conceptual mind, which I did over and over and over. It confronts you with self-consciousness, all of these things. And I didn't like that. You know, I would rather, I much would rather have gone and met my teacher, my teachers, because I worked with both of them and have them confirm that, wow, aren't you a great practitioner in spacious awareness? Isn't the Dharma wonderful? Which would happen once in a while. But with koan training, a lot of what you get is, nah, that's, that's your ego. Bring me something other than your ego or show or, or manifest something beyond what you think you know. So I was resistant to what it was bringing up. The, the, if, if one does formal koan study, it is intensely purifying on all these different levels, as well as a lot of fun and dynamic and unique. And there's nothing like it that I've encountered, but I found it like uh, being put through the ringer. And whereas in an open awareness practice, I wasn't confronted with my tendency to grasp in the same way, when I was given a koan and koan after koan, the um, grasping and the, the way in which my fixed views were ingrained would catch me every time. And that was something I could not, um, could not avoid meeting with each new koan. Hmm. What would you tell yourself at the time that you began koan practice? If this person told that person? Yeah, that's right. I, I wish he could have been more wholehearted in it. You know, there's a sense in which I would be so intense on the koan, I would get bloodshot eyes during session. Mm. But also there was a kind of resistance that was just um, a needing to be good or um, a part of me that needed to know the answer or needed to be confirmed by the teacher, that from here I can see none of that is really important. And it's, it's all just a source of suffering. But, you know, actually, Tashin, if I was to tell him that, he couldn't understand it. Because <laughs> the point of the practice, or one of the points of the practice, is to confront you with these things. You know, we have to have methods that bring up, bring us up against how tenaciously deep rooted self image and self grasping are. Mm. There's no way around that mm. from my, in my opinion. So one, one thing I could maybe, it would have been nice to hear from a senior person is um, that this is what happens. Mm. Like what you're going through in this process, this rough alchemy of Zen training, especially with the koans, is supposed to happen. You're supposed to hate your teacher. Mm. You're supposed to want to run away. Mm. You are supposed to be so confused. You are supposed to be thrust into despair. Victor Hori, I later read, said that the purpose of the koan is to thrust the student into spiritual crisis. A desirable thing on the other side, when you understand how that changes you, but not a desirable thing from the place that you begin. Mm. So it would have been nice if there was more community culture around it. When I was really young in the monastery, the other people who were doing koan study, we were competitive with each other. There were some people who were good at the koans and somehow they let us know how far along they were because it's a curriculum that advances. And on one hand, actually competitive energy can be metabolized really well in the Dharma. It's not <laughs> a bad thing. It just gets all put in that furnace. On the other hand, if there was more of a culture of uh, camaraderie and mutual love and support, that could have been really helpful as I was going through what I was going through with the koans. That, there was some of that, to be fair, but... It's a weird practice. It's not something that everybody was doing. So in some ways, I felt kind of alone with it. Mm -hmm. Teachers wouldn't want to talk about it or conceptualize it. It was just something we did and not something we needed to understand. Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. That sounds familiar. Uh, yeah. 
Well, good news. We're on my podcast where we get to talk about what I want. So uh, <laughs> okay, let's do it. Uh, how would you explain to the logical mind what koan practice is and how to do it? I, I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. But I guess I should try. To the logical mind, the rational mind. That's right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it, it, in the Japanese systems, it, so first of all, that to say that my background is in the Japanese koan systems that I received through kind of a blend of lineages that my teachers went through and, and shared with us. So this doesn't represent Korean or Chinese Zen or Vietnamese. It really is a Japanese thing. There's a curriculum and the curriculum goes through phases of the training. And the first koans are called Dharmakaya koans. And their intent is to give you a deep taste of what lies beyond self image. And what, ha what does it mean to forget the self? And those koans, um, through absorption in something you cannot grasp and you cannot understand and you cannot sink your teeth into you, um, help you fall into, along with the alchemy of the teacher pressuring you to resolve this dilemma, help you fall into the space beyond yourself help you recognize something deeper than your personality and even deeper than your body and mind. And so those are sometimes called breakthrough koans. And people can read all about these and all kinds of books, so we don't have to spend the time on that. But And the breakthrough koans are a gathering of passion. And the beautiful thing about koan practice in distinction to some forms of meditation, some forms of meditation are kind of like, calm down, pacify your mind, become tranquil. That's actually one message of Buddhism that I think is problematic. The breakthrough koans say, that's not quite the point. Take that passion and let it gather into the heat of awareness. Let it gather into um, the fire of wordless curiosity that brings you up to the very edge of what you can know and let that fire build. So in a sense, it's actually a practice of energy more than anything. Anybody who says koans or puzzles or riddles has never really engaged them in the way that we're talking about. They're not puzzles or riddles at all. Maybe to the logical mind, they're riddleish because they are not accessible. The true import and the true, what you are delivered into um, is not of the domain of the rational mind. We could describe some of the insights with the rational mind, but where they're, what we're delivered into is not rational or necessarily logical. So it's a practice of great energy, great passion and great curiosity. And in that sense, it's beautiful because it uses what we are. You know, it, it uses the, the basic spiritual longing in, in a very direct way. That energy is, is tapped and folded in. It uses frustration. It uses anger. It uses all of it. It's just all one just, just ball of, of energy that you gather. Now, of course, this is my idiosyncratic experience of the koans as a 24-year-old young man mm -hmm. and so somebody could have a different disposition and different energy and they could have a very gentle uh, and and even um, graceful relationship with these same practices but for me it was very much about passion at the very least it's it's um, curiosity is tapped as a resource i think and then after whatever kind of experience arises out of that, there are a whole series of practices that are meant to, I think of it as like sticking a wedge in a door. A door has been opened beyond your ordinary conceptual mind, beyond the self image and it all it's grasping and, and positioning. Something has been stuck. You have some light coming through and this other series of koans um, help you keep that door open and open it wider and wider. And they have to do with 
um, from the space of emptiness, how can you manifest yourself? How can you express freely? Can you forget yourself and become a dog turd, an old wise tea lady? Can you become that person you hate? Can you, how fluid are you? Because fluidity is the fruit of a true insight into emptiness. You're not stuck on views. You're not stuck on who you think you are. And so the koans make that, you have to embody that in many, many different ways. Hmm. So in a sense, they go from there. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if any of this is actually making sense or not, but. It makes wonderful sense and it's okay. uh, an act of compassion, I think, to speak so beautifully about it. Yes. Uh, and if I understand correctly, uh, while you were at Great Bow, there was a time where you were teaching yourself. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, from my, from this place, I started teaching way too prematurely. Mm. Um, my teachers, I bowed to my teachers and, and that's why I did it. So I was, I started teaching meditation at Reed College in like 2006, I think, 2007, something like that. So I was already in that role where for better or worse, I was being a mouthpiece of what Zen practice is hmm. and how do we engage Buddhism. And then that, that system, you gradually teach maybe more classes, maybe beginning instruction. Uh, maybe you'll get to teach a beginner's retreat at some point. And by 2012, I was assisting with session and starting to do interview with beginning practitioners. And then I received Dharma transmission in 2015, I believe. And that was around that time I started doing session on my own and teaching elsewhere. Hmm. Yeah. What was that period of teaching like for you? Um, you know, the reason I think that people teach prematurely and why it's good to take it slowly is what happened for me was, well, the teacher thinks I'm qualified to teach, so I must know something. Hmm. Hmm. It really takes a lot of purification to be put in one of these roles where you're seen as a spiritual authority and not let it be subtly folded into self-image and to feel that you're somebody who knows, who knows more than other people, that you're somebody who has a special mind that, well, if only others had some taste of this special mind. It takes a lot of practice to no longer have that operating. And so I did, and, and um, what happened for me is of course, there was my like, genuine desire to share what I loved and what was passionate. And also mixed with that was insecurity, that I wasn't there, that I wasn't qualified. And the way I compensated to that insecurity is I held it really tightly. Mm -hmm. I had to be the one that knew. My style of teaching was kind of, I was over, right? They were under. My teachings would have a flavor of, I know, right? I know the true way such and such Dogen said it, I believe it, it's the truth, you should too. Mm -hmm. There was this kind of, um, I hadn't really gone beyond the knowing of the Dharma. And so while I think my intention was good and ultimately it's helpful to learn to teach, I felt like there was some unnecessary um, arrogance I inflicted on other people, mm -hmm. you know. I had my, my teachers supervising me and giving me feedback. And I believe from their point of view, they would say all of that was good because in that way, teaching purified you and showed you the limit of your practice. On the other hand, I feel like there's something to be said for somebody spending at least 15 or 20 years in, in, in intensive practice before they start teaching, mm. which is very not fashionable nowadays. Is, is kind of 180 degrees from how most people are thinking about, about Dharma qualifications. Um, but we're dealing with people's faith and we're dealing with the deepest matter of human being. And that is not something to 
interact with, to interact with that vulnerability and that precious heart that seeks awakening in an underqualified way is dangerous to people spiritually. Hmm. Right? And I'm speaking of the worst case scenarios, but it, it, it's, it's psychic surgery. It's, it's very delicate what, we, what teachers are doing with people when they have students who come to them in, in open faith. And there's no need to rush that. That's what I feel um, in hindsight. Um, on the other hand, I love teaching. I love teaching the Dharma. It's, um, I try to approach it like jazz in that I wanna, I wanna know the standards and really have paid homage to the lineage, but to really pay homage to the lineage, one has to be riffing on it. Mm -hmm. One has to advance it, one has to improvise. And if you read Dogen Zenji's writings, he said that that's actually, that's actually one of the stages of awakening is practice, realization, and expression. And by expression, he meant it has to be utterly unique to you. You can't parrot your teacher and you can't parrot someone else's ideas. So I love that as a challenge of how can I not say the same thing? How can I say this fresh? And if I am saying the same thing and I get that feedback from my students, it means I'm actually teaching from kind of my conditioned self, not from the freshness of the Dharma. And I love that challenge. Um, I, I have a deep and deepening conviction that this is one of the most valuable things that human beings can do. So I feel this deep sense of gratitude and honor when I get to share it. And something that never fails is after I teach, I am energized. And that's a clue for me. And, and something I talk to my, my students and clients about is the clue, the feedback you're looking for about this is, the, is how it brings you alive. Of course, there are times when it doesn't bring you alive. That's another matter. But the energy, the, the, the vitality that the practice gives you is the feedback that this is the right thing for you to be doing or that it's a good thing for you to be doing. And so I feel that way about, about teaching. One of the things of getting more comfortable with it and purifying my pride from it is um, I no longer seek to impress people. For a long time, I thought, I want people to see me as mm. qualified. Here mm. I am with this purple rakasu on, and I'm insecure that other people think I'm not worthy of it, or I'm not worthy of this robe. And oh, so-and-so is the audience. I wonder what they think of my teaching. And so I would do performative dharma. And at this point, I'm not, I don't think I'm trying to do that in the same way if I am doing it. And therefore, it's much simpler. I just really try to be honest and just share what's both alive for me, what feels real for me, what's worked for me, with all due respect to um, the traditions. So it's gotten really simple. In, in that regard and more and more enjoyable. I mean, I used to be, you know, I used to almost shit myself before I'd give a Dharma talk. I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. right? And I'm, more or less, I think those years are behind me. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Huh. What did uh, getting transmission entail and what happened in your life and practice before that? I think getting transmission was really disappointing because I had hoped I would be something more, more special and shiny and juicy and than I, than I knew myself to be. Mm. So that was one thing that was interesting is I actually had deferred it. I had told my teachers I was not going to go through with it when they wanted me to, mm. which whether that was pride or whether that was me being the expert on my own mind, I'm not sure, mm. but there's a lot in Dharma transmission, at least I don't know about Rinzai, but in Soto Zen, um, Dharma transmission is essentially affirming your connection to the lineage and consenting to responsibility for it. Hmm. And you basically make a vow that you will do everything in your power to pass it on, hmm. that you won't let the 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 light 
fade out. You will do your best specifically to find somebody to transmit to hmm. so that the lineage will continue. And that's a, that's a big part of what it is. It also marks a turning point, at least as it's done in my little branch of Soto Zen. It marks a turning point in that you've completed your apprenticeship with your teacher. Hmm. So my relationship with them changed uh, immediately. And it went from being under their, their direction in an explicit way that I agreed to, to a more collegiate relationship where we were more like just um, colleagues hmm. working together. And they would still give me feedback about my practice, but it, it has a different flavor since hmm. then. So hmm. in some sense, I'm independent. I can do what I want and they can no longer tell me not to teach. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, someone told me it takes a good 10 years to figure out what transmission is about and to embody it. So mm. that's another thing. And it's like, well, what does it mean to hold a lineage? And especially someone like me, who's kind of, um, I follow my interests and I'm really not traditional. And I think most Soto Zen people would think I'm kind of heretical or kind of way off base in how I teach and practice. And that's okay with me. So what does it mean to be a lineage holder and what does it mean to have that responsibility to pass it on? That's something I'm you know, in the process of figuring out. Mm. Mm. And you're, you're about five years in, is that right? Well, did I, what, what year did you say you received transmission? I think it was 2015. Okay, so seven years. <coughs> seven years? Mm-hmm. I could be wrong. It could have been 2017, but anyways. no, no, I think I just misheard what you said. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It makes, makes me curious uh, where you'll be in three years then and what you'll say about this matter, but we'll have to fast forward and see. Uh, yeah. So maybe um, I told you this before we had this conversation that I hate being asked this question and you were, we talked about it and you were kind enough to be willing to ask this question as opposed to me who is stubborn and uh, cranky in this way. But uh, the question is, uh, why did you choose to leave the monastery? My first answer, which I hope the genuineness of convey is conveyed is that I didn't really choose. Mm. It's not really like that. You know, we, we, I tend to have this understanding that I'm this being moving through this world separate from circumstances and I'm navigating by my will. Do I go left or do I go right? And when we feel ourselves experientially embedded in the whole, it's not quite so simple. And so on one level, I feel like I didn't actually choose. It was just causes and conditions and things more mysterious than that just led to that unfolding mm -hmm. on another level um, i take being i took being ordained seriously and what it means to be living in a monastery and doing monastic life seriously and out of respect for that as I found my interests evolving and my proclivities and affinities shifting, I felt like it wasn't authentic for me to be in the garb and the practice of a monk any longer. Mm -hmm. I became very interested in um, Tibetan Buddhism, for example. I became very interested in theater practice. I became interested in psychedelic exploration. Um, I wanted to deepen my drumming practice and especially being an ordained teacher in the monastery where the part of that teaching is wholehearted dedication to that one thing of awakening and teaching awakening and supporting awakening. I could no longer do that without feeling that I was marginalizing really important things that were emerging. Mm. And I tried for a while. I tried to do it on the side and I just felt there's something incongruent about it. Mm. So that, that's a, a big factor. You know, monastic life, in a sense, is monotonous. It's mono. It's one thing. And I came to a place where I feel that it served its purpose. 
what I needed to learn from that matrix of training to the degree it did, it, it, it served me, it, it worked, it was a discipline and a container that I really needed and really benefited from. And then for the next iteration of my practice, I needed to work with a broader spectrum of energy in order both to deepen, expand, and test what I had learned. And there's a lot of limitations in monastic life that really were keeping that off the table. What year did you leave? I started going part time in either 2018 or I think 2018, I started going part time, hmm. started living in Portland part of the week and in the monastery part of the week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might have been 2019. I'm not exactly sure. But... Hmm. And what's your trajectory been since that time? Um, well, I started a business of spiritual coaching and parts work um, partly out of a desire to just reach more people and and be able to share what i've learned and share in the synergy of of inner work outside of zen and outside of buddhism and i had to also figure out how to make a living right and, and i wanted to make a living with the skills that i had developed and I, I had this thought in my mind that the la if I have to work at Target, I'm going to like my soul is going to shrivel into a little rotten seed. Hmm. Like something about not continue, not having my livelihood be connected to my deepest passion felt um, immensely wrong. And so I've given it a try. And so far it's working. Mm -hmm. like there, there's been some response from the universe in the form of human beings and enough money to pay the rent. And yeah, so my, that's part of my trajectory. And I, um, yeah, I, I dabble in lots of different things that I'm, that I'm interested in. I have a practice I call universe somatic, hmm. which I, I, before the pandemic, I used to do in person. And for a while during, during COVID, I was doing it online. And it's something that folds together, like the theater work I've done, Dzogchen practice, and also just a sense that we have to work more directly with energy um, in Zen and, and Buddhism in a way that doesn't happen sitting still in a cushion and doesn't happen in work practice. Hmm. And so anything that's similar to that practice that I like to teach, I engage in. Like I, I will take Muto classes when I get a chance. I practice something called paratheater which I did a few years of training with, very impactful for me. Um, continuum is a body-mind movement discipline. And all of these things for me are about working with the spectrum of energy in a very embodied and direct way and um, challenging that, that tendency to fixate on just one comfortable way of being or familiar expressions of myself. Hmm. As I'm saying this, I realize these things, this sounds so abstract. How do I make it concrete? Hmm. You know, um, so like paratheater, for example, is a practice where you would work directly with, um, you would start from what my teacher Antaro would call no form, which is standing emptiness. You make yourself empty. And then you designate an area of the room for a different archetypal quality. And let's say I was going to work with love and hate. So I would project the energy of love into one half of my room and hate in the other side. Hmm. And then from this condition of emptiness, I move into love or I move into hate and I let it fully animate me as much as possible. And then I would move between those and explore this, this um, relationship to surrendering to different kinds of bandwidths of being. And so all the different things I've done have been uh, different iterations of that. And then I brought that into universe somatic in my own way. Hmm. What are the different offerings that you provide for these days? 
I do, um, the main thing I do with people is parts work. Mm -hmm. And um, voice dialogue was part of my training at Great Val from the beginning. It was like one of the tools that we use to do, do what meditation practice can't do or address things that it doesn't tend to address mm -hmm. as far as different um, emotional and psychological things that come up. So uh, I carried, I've carried that thread forward. Um, voice dialogue is similar to internal family systems. So I do a lot of that with clients, parts work. Um, should I talk about parts work or is your audience familiar with that? Um, probably people will be familiar with it, but I wonder if you might speak to any differences there are between voice dialogue and uh, say IFS or something else. Well, the one difference between voice dialogue and IFS is that IFS is, was developed to address trauma. Mm. And a lot of it is about working with, with deep traumas. And voice dialogue developed as an awareness discipline specifically. Mm. And so there's much more emphasis on the point is not the parts themselves, you know, the part of me that wants to leave the monastery, the part of me that wants to stay right or the innumerable different perspectives that live in us it's not so much about the parts themselves in voice dialogue it's about the awareness that is opened up when you disidentify from them hmm. because so many things are self-image is in one sense something you can never fully see yourself the different the different perspectives that we're looking from are often off the radar and the practice of, of voice dialogue is to move into so in a session people actually physically move over like if we were doing it you would move over to your right you would move your chair and i would talk to the part of tashin that maybe wishes he wasn't doing a podcast right now mm. and you would just give full expression to that mm. right full expression uninhibited and then we'd have you move back to the center and fully let go of it and other techniques that would help develop this awareness that really creates this disidentification from these different aspects of ourselves that is really difficult to find any other way hmm. Hmm. so that's that's um that's the main difference i think between ifs and voice dialogue at least in practice and theory the results of someone who do does extensive parts work might actually be very similar. Mm -hmm. The result mm -hmm. is somebody who is really aware of the different perspectives, the different parts that live in themselves and has access to them. There's, there's much less a sense of, oh, I can't be like that. That's not okay. Or that's unlovable. I'm going to put that in the closet. The fruit of parts work is a really inclusive awareness and embrace of everything that we are. Mm. And I, I imagine that they meet in the same place. How would you describe what meditation is not able to do that these modalities are? Yeah. Well, one of the things I discovered in myself is that First of all, people without knowing it slide into spiritual selves. Hmm. Earlier I was using the terminology like performative spirituality. And that is they get into an, they make an identity out of being empty or being loving or being equanimous or being of service. And it, rather than it being the actual unfixed, empty, bright space of those, that those things arise from, it becomes a subtly performed idea. It becomes a new personality. And I definitely did that. And one of the things I um, found was that the practice can reinforce that. If you're doing intensive spiritual practice, and if you're in a community that holds these ways of being as a value, it's very, di it's very difficult to not imperceptibly slide into actually, um, acting those ways rather than actually being the Dharma. Hmm. 
And so these practices helped me do that in a way that my sitting meditation didn't because it reinforced. So I would sit and I would, um, maybe I would come to a genuinely um, positionless place, a genuinely untethered place, or maybe I would leave in my kind of good Zen student self that's trying to be mindful and acting tranquil and pretending that I'm not irritated when somebody you know, coughs over breakfast or whatever it might be. So those things weren't really getting caught on the radar of my sitting, weren't being, weren't being broken down. And also I think different roles that we find ourselves in aren't addressed on the cushion because we're not in the roles on the cushion. So what I mean is when we encounter each other, especially if we have an established relationship, we tend to dream each other up into different ways of relating. If you see me as the guy who treated you poorly um, for the last couple of months, and I see you as the person I want to avoid because I did treat you poorly, then there's this way in which I become um, a certain version of myself when I interact with you. That actually only arises in the moment of when I interact with you. And therefore, it's very difficult for the practice to permeate into that because it's so situational. When you're on the cushion, you're, we're instructed to let go of our relationships, to let go of all those entanglements. It's um, a practice that is really biased towards non-relationality, traditionally. And so a voice dialogue is recognizing that these things would happen like Oh yeah, there's this way in which I become totally judgmental when I see my girlfriend eating ice cream. Right. How would you work with that on your meditation cushion? You might see those thoughts arise and you might be able to drop them, but it actually doesn't address the full-blooded energetic reality of that part of you. It really doesn't address the underlying belief systems. In other words, meditation can fail at penetrating and melting fixed beliefs. Mm. And some of the evidence for this is how rigid a lot of spiritual teachers can be and how much they can be righteous about my way is the right way and other teachers are wrong. And these, these fixed beliefs about right and wrong, they don't necessarily come into the context of actual meditation. They need to be addressed in a different, a different uh, modality. It seems to me, I could be wrong. For me, that was true. Like when I started stepping into positions of, of authority as a teacher, when I sat in meditation, I just tried to let go into emptiness as much as possible. I definitely spiritually bypassed because I could, because that's, that's what I thought the practice was. There was no way for me to bring that arrogance as a teacher and really directly shine light on it in that context. Does that make sense? Definitely, yes. It's reminding me of a question that feels very similarly shaped, but um, let me see if I can articulate this. I'm wondering about the culture of monastic training that you participated in, which comes from Japan, as you say, and mm -hmm. from Asia and how you found that being an American and being of Western culture and what you would say about the differences between those cultures and what's actually useful for Westerners. Yeah. The first thing that popped to my mind is when I was at um, Sogenji, I quickly learned that um, Shoto Roshi um, used shame as a motivating force. Mm. So we would be in these long teishos and he would be with all his awake passion berating us for not getting it and for not being awake and not being free. Mm -hmm. And for me, and I think many of the other Westerners, rather than that being motivated, it just triggered our inner critics. We just felt like shit. Mm. We were shamed rather than exhorted and motivated. Mm. So... In one sense, some of the traditional emphasis on push, try harder, 
actually can be counterproductive or create significant trauma or dissonance in people. Right? We, we, I, don't, I don't know anything about Asian parenting, but I do know that lots of us come in with significant um, wounding that the Asian model can actually just hook right into that and feed a sense of low self-esteem. I'm not there yet. I'm no good. I haven't got it. And, and that low self-esteem, I haven't got it, feeds into a grasping, kind of counterproductive, striving approach to the practice itself. Hmm. Um, the thing to say is I have actually never trained extensively in an Asian monastery. So all I really know is two American teachers who trained with Japanese teachers who did their best to make it work for American students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's an experiment. It can't be anything other than an experiment because nobody knows yet. Like these traditions are, have barely been on our soil for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And whatever criteria we use for it working, I mean, what's the criteria for a spiritual community working or being healthy or, or awakening happening in people. Can we really objectively say it's working? People are becoming awake. Well, we can look at their behavior. We can look at, do they treat each other with love and kindness? We can look and see, do um, flexible, soft hearted, caring people come out of these communities? I think that's all we can do. But as far as the experiment of transplanting this body of methods and views, not all of which will transplant because we reject a lot of Asian Buddhist view. This experiment, the, maybe all we'll ever have is hindsight mm. and say, well, not sure that that experiment went so well. Let's tweak things a little bit this way and that way. And mm. that is definitely the flavor of Great Vow. It's an experimental community with a core of Zazen and monthly session. That never changes. We have a schedule. We, we try to live the Bodhisattva vow. We do meditation retreat. And then around all of that, there's always been experimentation about what will help liberate the heart and mind. How do we live together in a loving and respectful way? How do we make a contribution to society? All of those things are, I think, open questions. <laughs> that, that, let me I'll say one more thing is, I'm not sure how much the Asian teachers can help us with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They can help us see how deep awakening can be and the fruit of um, giving oneself over to training very wholeheartedly. We can definitely see that in them. But making it work for us, I'm not sure how much they can do that. I think mm -hmm. it's, it's really just been placed in our hands to undertake this experiment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And monastic yeah. life is not the only experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. For example, in, in, I have a friend who trained extensively in Soto monasteries. And the basic view among Soto Zen monastics is that there's no such thing as real lay practice. Mm. That one has to become a priest and enter that system in order to um, truly wake up and do a genuine life of Dharma. And so, even more so, the experiment of people practicing as lay people outside of those systems. We have to figure that out. I feel um, unqualified to have an opinion about whether or not shame would work for Asians in Asian monasteries, but I do have the opinion that shame doesn't work for Westerners uh, <laughs> because it didn't work for me, I think, uh, or had mixed results. Um, I want to ask you about that a little bit more. In the period where you're teaching at Great Vow, in retrospect, when you look back at that, do you think that you used shame as a teaching tool? I th one thing I think happens is every teacher leaks out their unfinished business without mm -hmm. exception. Mm -hmm. And so whatever degree to which I had still internalized a harsh, try harder, if you're not getting it, it's because you're not doing it right idea. To whatever degree that was still alive in me, it, it had to leak out. Because mm -hmm. every teacher, every, every teacher's 
state of mind and, and practice, their inner reality is part of their teaching. It's, it's bleeding out. It's leaking mm -hmm. out. Hopefully for better. Oftentimes it's not so simple. And so probably I did a little bit. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I encountered um, Dzogchen, it was a big shift for me because there's much more emphasis on... I had an experiential shift where um, awareness was no longer in any way a possession of me. Mm. You know, awareness is a, is a transpersonal, it's the transpersonal reality. Awareness is coming through me. It's not something I exert, do, or practice. And something there really shifted in that that is not a matter of trying. All we can do is consent to getting out of the way. So luckily around the time I was moving into a teacher, I encountered these teachings that had a much more relaxed flavor than, than I had encountered in Zen. And that, I think that helped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also doing more of this work with just embracing the full spectrum of emotion and things that live in me, mm. you know, like, um, a lot of what I do in parts work with people is working with the inner critic. In fact, like a number of clients I have are Dharma students who have wounds of shame and failure from what, from the time they spent in intensive practice mm. and just attending to the inner critic on its own terms, mm. not just a voice that you, you swipe away and say, that's just that thinking, which is the traditional, that's just thinking. Mm -hmm. to really in, an, in, a, in a full blooded way engage with the inner critic and empathize with it and try to understand it has a very different effect than just swatting away or dissolving these kind of deeply set judgmental tendencies mm -hmm. and so I continue to do that work myself and with others and I think that's um, if I don't shame it's partially related to that mm -hmm. and, and, I, wish, and... I wish some of my students practiced harder uh huh I, I, do, I do think that, you know, Jung said that the, the great passion of humanity is laziness. Mm. And I think a lot of us um, under respond to the calling for awakening. That is, we, we really do have a deep calling in our hearts. And because of fear of discomfort, we don't fully um, step into the depth of that calling. And in one way that looks is doing more practice. And so I wouldn't shame them or call them lazy, but I can think of some people I wish they would do more practice. Mm. Yeah. But um, shame doesn't seem to be helpful. Mm. What is helpful? I, I'm interested in one of the things my, um, this Dzogchen teacher was so important to me, Keith Dowman. One of the things he said is he said, practicing from discipline is no good. And what he meant by that, there was a lot more that he said. What, what I took from that is that one can actually practice directly from your love of truth, your love of spaciousness, your love of integrity, your love of awake energy. You can let that be the motivating force. You don't need shame. You don't need shoulds or oughts. You don't even need, you don't need anything but your own innate devotion. Anything else, anything apart from your innate love of reality, truth, awakening, becoming a compassionate human, anything other than that is kind of brittle. It's not actually dependable. So my, my practice and something I try to share and think about how do we contact this is to help contact that innate love of the practice. And sometimes that's focusing on the pleasure of it, which is a big, I believe, a big weakness in the Zen teachings that I've encountered. A big strength in Vajrayana, and I think it's some degree in uh, Pali-based Buddhism, like Vipassana traditions, for example, is to practice, like bliss is important. If you read, at least in Soto Zen, if you read their teachings, they're talking about the bliss of meditation continually. But somehow, I think in, in reaction to the hippie coming to the Zendo on mescaline thing, mm. the teachers who are the first generation of American teachers kind of didn't really address the deep pleasure of true meditation. Mm. 
but it's, it's there. There are currents of bliss running through our bodies. The opposite of sukha, uh, excuse me, of dukkha, friction, is, is sukha, which is, a, is pleasantness. And the Buddha explicitly talked about learning to feel and embody and, and um, amplify bliss, sukha, pleasantness in the body, in the breath. And so that's, that's one actual practice strategy that I work with is to dwell on the, the bliss of practice. It only grows. You may go beyond it. You may go, be, you, you, you may go beyond the good feeling. It won't become a crutch, as many teachers are worried about. You know? But so I'm going on a tangent here, but I think that's been one of my ways is to focus on the pleasure of the actual practice. Think how to ask this question. Wondering how you understand what precedes or causes or gives rise to awakening, and in particular, how you would teach that to Westerners. Mm. It's, it's the most beautiful, beautiful question. I have um, a friend who left monastic training um, in frustration. And one of his frustrations was when certain people would just stumble into a session and for no reason that was evident objectively um, just had a glimpse of awakening. It just happened. So there is something beyond all our understanding and strategizing, and you can't be summer, you can't sum it up to the seven factors of awakening or following the path correctly, or the best term I can think of is grace. Mm. There is an X factor. There is something beyond our understanding about awakening. And of course, a whole other conversation is what are we talking about? Because people don't mean the same thing. But that being said, I think that there are people who awaken by some mysterious, it just happens, you know? Maybe it was past lives, maybe, maybe God just binked them on the head and say, hey, I think I'll wake someone up today. You know, I don't know. <laughs> maybe somehow it's like an accident and there's some glitch in the time-space continuum and one of the effects is somebody unhooks from their ego long enough that they recognize their true nature. I don't know. But as far as those of us, and it's probably the majority who actually have to practice, I think there's something to be said for giving everything. There's something to be said for devotion, right? And that if you, you have to want awakening just as much as you want um, a new boyfriend, you have to want awakening probably more than a new boyfriend, more than a successful career. You, you, the devotion has to be enshrined in the altar of your heart. And that's embodied. It, it can be a feeling, but it has to become a feeling that's embodied by what you do. What you do with your time. Am I saying that that means that you have to go into an intensive practice environment? I'm not saying that, but that's one response to this intuition that that devotion has to be at the center of your heart. You have to embody it. Mm. So I believe that's in my, my very, very limited view of people who I can look out, both teachers of mine and students who I feel have had some takes of awakening. Devotion is a big factor. And sometimes devotion looks like desperation. It looks like... Um, all the false hopes of the conditioned world bottoming out. If you still truly believe that you could find a durable meaningfulness without awakening, then you will not turn all your energy towards awakening. It doesn't mean that the practice won't be profoundly beneficial or you won't have significant insights. 
if you don't turn everything towards it, if you don't have this kind of enshrining it in your heart. But it seems that that's one of these factors is, is this wholeheartedness. And it's wholeheartedness without bargain. You kind of have to um, close the escape hatch in some way. Because if you're still bargaining with, with spiritual life and awakening, you're basically saying, unless I get what I want, if I don't get what I want at X point, I'm out of here. This wasn't actually effective, therefore I'm now going to withdraw my energy. And I don't think you could find any practitioner who has given themselves wholeheartedly for 20 or 30 years who would say it didn't work. Mm. That would be an interesting question. Mm. I think you would find people who it, the fruit of that manifested through their body mind in different ways. But very few of them would say, I'm actually disappointed. I practiced the Dharma wholeheartedly and it failed me. So the bargaining thing is kind of this consumerist mentality we can bring to it where we're in it, but we're kind of watching to see if we're getting what we want. And that very watching to see if we're getting what we want is itself the obstacle to the fruition. So that's, that's how this full-blooded devotion, which I want to emphasize to whoever's watching, does not mean you do what Tashin or I did. It absolutely does not need to, need to mean that. But we have to discover what it means. Hmm. Um, the other thing I would say is it's important to be in proximity of somebody, to work with somebody, to interact with somebody who is has more realization than we do. Hmm. Right? And if we still believe this kind of everyone's equal, no one has realization, it's, that I, I think we're that's worth examining. It's just like, there's a sense in which it's like anything. There are people who are more or less developed. You know, I'm not as qualified as someone who went to medical school to give you advice about your health. Right? We, we have to, um, and there's lots of different kinds of teachers, but to embrace spiritual authority to the degree that we can is really important because we need a force outside of our own um, self-deception you have to have that force the buddha had that force for sure right so and and the tried and true force outside of the self-deception of our own ego is a teacher and the more awake that teacher is a person can't can't help you get somewhere they've never been. They simply can't. And we get into some really tricky territory here because we never actually know what someone else's state of mind is. We never know. This is the territory of faith. But I think there's a confidence, an unmistakable, palpable confidence that is an energetic field effect that comes from somebody who has accomplished the path to a certain level that we can bask in, we can be really empowered by. I've had the experience of um, doing some practices, I experienced it with Keith Dowman, some of these practices that had more complex um, visualizations and they were somewhat esoteric, that when I would do them with him, I could really do them and I tasted what they're about. It was like, um, it was a real transmission. And then when I went home and struggled with them, I at least had the residue. I had the embodied memory of what it was like to taste how those practices work more deeply. Hmm. So I'm of the thought that if someone is really interested in awakening, it's, it is worth moving across the country. It is worth, you know, these are archetypal examples of people leaving their families and, and, upending their life in order to practice with a teacher who really inspires them, from my point of view, that's entirely worth it. That's sanity. If you, you know, there's something to be said for checking somebody out and I'm not in support of abandoning your wife and children and all of that. But I, I do feel that the spiritual longing is something very profound and, and ultimately beneficent to really step into. 
Well, I don't know. I don't know how awakening happens. Hmm. I don't know who's awake. I really, you know, these this this territory is so um, mysterious. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I just have opinions. Your opinions are welcome here. <laughs> All right. Uh, is there anything that you feel would be fruitful to say about how different people see awakening differently and how you see it? I just have questions. And here's a question. What if the perennial philosophy is wrong and a person in the Vipassana tradition, a person in Zen tradition, and a person in the Sufi tradition, there is awakening and there is deep liberation, but it's not the same. Hmm. What if we are shaped by the culture of the practice and the practices, and we're actually delivered into um, a freedom and an awakening that is not the same mountaintop that everybody goes to? And so instead of trying to reconcile the different views, we start to embrace that there is a multiplicity of fruitions. They all seem to include no longer being identified with your self-image, with the personality being a subset of something larger. But beyond that, what if just like nature doesn't have one flower, you know, nature doesn't have one animal, one season. What if awakening is like that too? We don't say that a cat is the real animal and a dog is not. So people put so much into their contemplative life and there's so much sacrifice and passion and that constellates the grasping at certainty. This is why one of the things the Buddha said, the hardest thing for a contemplative to let go of is their fixed views. Mm. It's so hard to give yourself to the mystery wholeheartedly and to not want to have it right, to have the right path, the right this or that. Very difficult. And so many people um, feel like they've got it. And that, and if you've got it, that means by default someone else doesn't. Mm. And I don't think it needs to be that way. Now, what if what if it's bigger than any definition? What if its expressions are variegated? And the only thing that we can say seems to be universal is that we don't take our thoughts, our perceptions, our personalities as the biggest truth. I'm glad I asked that beautiful answer, my friend. I have one more thing. Can I add one more thing? Please. And I, what, what's coming up for me is I'm very excited because these are things I like to talk about that I never get to talk about. Mm. Right. And I can talk about them with somebody who can really have this conversation. Mm. I had this experience of going from a 10 day Zen retreat to a 10 day Dzogchen retreat, mm. which present a different culture of the fruition of practice and a different sense of where these things how does freedom look? And I, maybe I got lucky, but I really got this experience of these practices seem so similar from the outside, but what I was experiencing in my body and mind on every level was qualitatively different in each setting and in each practice culture. Mm. It was qualitatively different. And it wasn't a matter of right or wrong. It was a matter of what was being emphasized. What was being celebrated by the tradition itself and the teacher itself creates these cultures that actually parameter what fruition can arise and what will arise. So. How would you describe that qualitative difference? (laughs) Yeah. Um, the sense in, in my, in my Zen lineage is not being stuck anywhere, that there is no object called awakening. There's no, there's no need to fixate on some state of mind. 
There's no special shiny thing that you um, get to experience that other people don't, but you, you, you're free from even that. You're free from even spirituality. You're delivered from Zen itself. And therefore, you're totally flexible. Right? Doesn't mean there aren't um, mystical states and states of ex great expansion and great luminosity. But the main point is to not be stuck anywhere. I think um, one of the old Zen sages said, you're like a pearl rolling on a tray. Whereas my sense in, in opening to um, the Dzogchen and the Vajrayana teachings is that life, it, life is a sacred luminosity. That the phenomenal world itself is transfigured into um, a bright dream. And that's more emphasized and kind of leaned into. But maybe if I was really accomplished, they would all converge in the same place. But see, the emphasis, the emphasis on koan study, for example, is not being stuck anywhere, right? And, and any, any making an identity at all out of being a practitioner, even that has to be swept away. Mm. Whereas I don't find that to the same degree in, in my little experience of other traditions. Mm. Mm. So it, it, the embodiment feels and looks differently, I think. Like there's an ideal in Zen that the awakened person maybe wouldn't even recognize them if you met them. They've, they've shed the traces of the Dharma. You might see them at the grocery store and just be, it's an ordinary lady. And then later you see them on the Dharma seat and you're like, oh, right. But the ideal seems to be more in the other traditions that this person might be extraordinary. You would really, you would really know, right? There'd be something shiny there. Mm. I'm inspired to ask a kind of question that I don't know that I usually ask. Uh, maybe it's because of your uh, theater background. Uh, feels like a playful kind of question. So okay. allow me to be playful here. Sure. Uh, imagine that there were, uh, shall we say, uh, a sort of straw Buddhist teacher. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> they're not a real person, but they're a character of a real person, okay. a character. Um, and they're like, you know, Jogan, you left the monastery and now what is it that you're doing other this, this other stuff, theater, you know, yeah. universal embodiment, did you say it is? I'm not yeah. sure I heard correctly. What's that all about? What's the uh -huh. point of all that? Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to such a person? I just, I just love all the expressions of the universe. I just want, I just want to be emptiness playing in form. And then I want to be form that returns to emptiness. I just want to do that dance. And I need a means to do that dance. I can't do the dance of form and emptiness fully just sitting on a cushion or sweeping the sidewalk. No, form is wide and varied. There's this whole spectrum of energy. It can't be boxed into this little mold of what's, uh, what's acceptable and what's unacceptable. So I just want to play the Dharma. Out of this great space, so many energies arise, and from the perspective of the space, they're equally beautiful. I want to taste that. Mm. I like that. I feel, um, let's see. I feel like, uh, yeah, again, like, um, I'm going to ask you the same question again from a more ordinary Tashin way of asking it. And I'm okay. glad that I asked you the playful way because I think I, I really liked that answer quite a bit. It, was, okay. it, got, it got the same thing that you're about to say, but in a different angle. So, uh, okay. yes. Um, how would you describe the different things that you do that aren't, uh, you know, conventionally associated with Dharma, you know, conventionally? Um, these days, like what are the different things that you do personally in your own life? Yeah. And yeah. how would you describe the value that you personally find in them? Yeah. Um, I play drums, both in a kind of free jazz and like experimental context with some other musicians here at Asheville. And I, I play solo and I'm, I'm trying to live into the koan of spontaneity. How does one act free of fixed patterns? 
how do I not just follow the same template of human being and just repeat what I've done in the past? And so I love being in that space of improvisation where it creates the conditions for spontaneity to arise, which to me is like the most beautiful thing, true spontaneity. Something I liked about koan study when it would happen. Um, the kind of movement work I do, like buto and continuum and my own universe somatic practice, they're rituals that allow me to play in energies that everyday life affords no means. There's no means for me to become um, a waterfall in my day to day. There's no means for me to become a cat. There's no means for me to go to hell or heaven in, in this direct embodied way. I need a ritual. I need a method in order, a, a vessel to flow into, and that's embodied. And so all of these practices for me are, are the, the shape in which I can actually embody this fuller spectrum of the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, also, I also feel that um, the more I do really deep embodiment practices, the more that, that penetrates my meditation. And, and then my, my body is suffused with, an, with awareness in a, in a deeper way that um, those kind of practices really serve. Mm. Mm. I do all kinds of stuff, so I'm like kind of racking my brain. What else do I do? I don't even want to know what I do. Yeah. Uh-oh, I want to know what you do. <laughs> we may be no, I, think I, I think I touched on the main thing. Yes. Um, you know, there's a practice, the practice that sparked my universe somatic practice that is, has a commonality with all of these things is a Dzogchen practice called Ruzhen. Mm. And in Ruzhen, you move from sitting in open awareness, and ideally the practitioner has a real taste of emptiness. They're not sitting as me doing this practice of open awareness. It's just open awareness. And then you move into the six realms of existence, hell, deep thirst, animal instinct, 100% blissful hedonism, the suffering of a human realm, um, ghosts. You move into those and you fully embody them 100% with your body, speech, and mind. Mm. That, was, that first whet my appetite for this kind of practice. Mm. What is it like to not have any fear, to totally agree to all the different states that are normally taken as suffering? If you fully agree to a state of suffering, is it still a suffering? Hmm. The theory is that it's the play of the Dharmakaya. It's a play of energy, and that changes everything. So I did that practice in a couple of different ways, and I think now I'm looking for any way or form that that, that can be done in my hmm. everyday life. Hmm. Hmm. Can you tell me more about... Um... You talked earlier about paratheater and sort of the idea of it, but what, what is your experience with that then, personally? Oh man, paratheater was, paratheater was a hugely life-changing thing. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it was meeting the teacher, uh, this guy who's a filmmaker and author named Antaro Ali, who is a kind of punk rock non-lineage mystic. He's one of these people who really has deep realization and freedom, and it wasn't through any traditional route. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of LSD as a young man. He dabbled in some interesting things, and he came up with this practice that he created and developed over like 40 years. Mm -hmm. And people can find out about paratheater through, easily through searching. And paratheater... Paratheater is really about um, how does the divine like to play? And where am I, where, where am I um, afraid to play in the divine? Where there was one ritual we did where you would start in this emptiness, right? emptying yourself out, receptivity, and then the center, the outer periphery of the room was um, broken self. And the prompt was to let the quality of broken self animate you. And so all of us in the practice were just fully embodying everything in ourselves that we felt was broken or broken in the world. And, and fully an energetic reality, just getting into that through our voice, our bodies, 
And then in the center of the room, there was diamond self. Hmm. And whenever you wanted to, you could move into and discover what is it for you to enter diamond self. So there's something about paratheater where art, emptiness, and archetypal energy really meet that I've never encountered elsewhere. It's sort of like, what if um, spiritual practice was more like abstract expressionism? Hmm. There is some form, there are colors you're working with, but it's all about the, the free flow of these energies and, and an open canvas. It's... <sighs> You know, I can only talk about what we did rather than what it is. We did um, a six week intensive study called Dream Body. And in Dream Body, the idea was for the dream world and the waking world to collapse into each other. Hmm. And so what we did was we recorded any movements that we found in our nightly dreams, whether it was a palm tree swaying, a woman walking down the street, we would record those movements and then we made a ritual dance of them and we linked them together. And so we were bringing the dream world into the waking world. And then we would work with this polarity between earth body being a physical material cre creature and then being a dream body through entering these dream images. And so there is a way in which paratheater is about the imaginal realm fully being brought into the physical realm. Hmm. And for me, I hadn't really, except a little bit in koan practice and a little bit in some Vajrayana, I hadn't really encountered how deep and rich working with the imaginal is until paratheater. Hmm. So, yeah, and that's something I still do here in Asheville with, with people occasionally. You sent along a, a video that you made, I think, with the gentleman that you were talking about. Can you tell me more about that project? Yeah, um, he, he made it. It was his movie. Uh -huh. um, and you starred in it. I, I, I starred in it. It was about a monk who misunderstands meditation as spiritual escapism. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it's a quirky exploration of spiritual bypassing mm -hmm. and um, how we might without our knowing it, use spiritual practice not to address our wounding, but to escape it. And I believe that he saw me part of my path as having done that hmm. and having come to some resolution of it. And we filmed that movie mostly at Great Vow as I was transitioning out of um, Great, Great Vow, as I was transitioning out of being a, a monastic. So I don't necessarily agree with his uh, view of what I was doing all those years, but you know that's a thing we all we all face. I think is to what degree are we using spirituality to avoid the mess and wounds and inconvenience of being human? Mm. So it's kind of about that. Mm. It's called Vanishing Field. If any of your listeners are curious, it's a quirky, interesting, independent film. Mm. What was that like for you working on that project? I love acting because mm. acting is a practice of no self. Mm. You know, I, I made, me, made me really think about a great actor knows something about the Dharma because to fully step into another view, another perspective, another embodiment, you have to forget yourself. And so the challenge of it was really interesting to me. I, to, I, I, I wasn't really playing myself. I, I, I believe I was playing another character even though it was loosely his idea of who I was. And mm. so it was super fun. Yeah. Mm. And I, I welcome more roles. Mm. If anybody has a, needs an actor like me, I'd be happy to, to mm. do more. I just, I just love the art mm. of theater. Mm. Yeah. I remember we did some live performances of pair theater rituals that we had worked on. And I had never faced such um, stage fright. It was, it was, again, a thing of there are some, without the right context, some things that are in us can't actually be worked with, mm -hmm. which is like a basic tantric principle. Like you can't fully understand and illuminate the passions if you're in a monastery, mm -hmm. right? So whether that's true or not is debatable, but um, theater really opened me up to... Um, 
how harrowing self-consciousness can actually be. Hmm. And performing in that way was, was quite um, a, good, a good experience. I'm remembering that you said earlier in the conversation that, uh, you know, when you were a young man, like it, uh, you felt like uh, there were two things that you said, I, f I forget the other one, but that uh, you felt like you, oh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing my memory here, but that like you needed protection from these draws towards women and, and something else. And I, I, you know, you just mentioned now about the passions and Tantra, and I wonder how you see relationships now and women in your life and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend is the best guru, uh -huh. no doubt about it. Uh -huh. Yeah, if you want to know if somebody's free, ask their partner, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. So um, I wouldn't let you ask her. Uh -huh. Okay. Right? Yeah. I won't yeah. have her on the podcast then. Sorry. Yeah. Please, please don't. Please I'm don't. sure she'd be I'd like to say to talk to. You, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I mean I really believe that. If you're honest, if you honestly enter with a mind of Dharma, a romantic relationship, you get a very profound mirror of how deep karmic patterns are. Mm -hmm. You get one that maybe is hard to see otherwise. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but um, no, I love women. That's why, that's why, and I love this one. That's why I have her in my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that I had a hunger for the feminine. Let me, let me give some background is that Great Vow is not a celibate monastery. Mm -hmm. the, the abbots are a married couple. Mm -hmm. And so for a number of years, my partner was also an ordained person. Mm -hmm. So I didn't put aside relationship and, and sexuality. Mm -hmm. But we had, we had broken up. And I really did a lot of soul searching of, is this a craving for you know, all the negative things we can say about romance and partnership that I'm trying to fill a hole in myself, etc.? Or is it something else? And one of the things I clarified for myself is that I do love the feminine. And that am I um, incomplete without it? No. Do I love the presence of the feminine in the form of a living woman in my life? I do. Mm. With all its difficulties. Mm. With, all, with all the challenges that come with that. Uh, it's a... Uh, of course, we're not talking in the abstract. I'm talking about my partner, this woman. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just what she is. Mm -hmm. You know, she is a woman. What she is as a woman and all that comes with that. I, I find that a profoundly nourishing energy. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't choose celibacy, not anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Did that for a while. Don't, wouldn't choose it now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And music... Um, that was definitely the weak point of my practice. Yeah, I'm still still buying tapes and records. Mm. Mm. You know, there's already thousands something of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a appreciative point of view, I would just say I love um, discovering new music. I just mm. love exploring these different iterations of tone, color, and, and rhythm. And it is kind of... Um, I have a statue of the goddess of art and music, Saraswati, above mm. my tape collection, and I just consider it part of my devotional practice to her. Mm. You know? mm. My critic says I shouldn't be a consumer of of musical goods, but mm. my part that's devoted to Saraswati sees it very differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have a mystical relationship with sound. There's something about about sound and especially music that I can dissolve my boundaries really easily. And so it's not, it's not just passive consumption. It's much more than that for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize the speech act that you had at the beginning of that answer where you said uh, that was a weak point of my practice? Was, was that a joke or a sarcasm or was the inner well, critic coming out there or? Yeah, a, a critic or my, my, uh, the part of me that aspires to be a pure practitioner. Mm. That, that part would just say, yeah, you've got enough. Mm. You know, and it says, if, if these really were satisfying, then why would you have a thousand of them? Mm. You know, mm. if they were really, if it really nourished you, you would only need one. Mm. And so these deep kind of spiritual ideals and principles do live in me. Mm. You know? 
maybe you could take a monk out of the monastery, but can't take the, you know, the saying? Renunciate it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Huh. yeah. But that's, that's, uh, that's not so loud in me. Huh. I find myself confused by this. Um, let me see if I can put it into words. I, uh, I'm confused about why that is still present in you and why it seems it's it seems to me in this conversation it seems particularly associated with music and you didn't say similar things about theater for example or you know other things that you do now. Oh, I think it's because they're they're um physical objects. Mm. Mm. It's not listening. It's ordering the new Antelope album. Okay. Like do I need this physical emblem of this music I could just press play on the internet huh. right and so I think there's a part of me that aspires to be really unmaterialistic huh. I heard a story about you once that was hearsay so it could be false and if it's false you can correct it on record okay. but I'm curious what the truth is and what you would say about it now uh -oh. the, the story as I heard it is that you had enormous enormous record collection and at one point you decided to throw it away is that true? Oh, this is the only regret I have in my whole life. That's what I heard. Yeah. No, when I ordained, so I, I lived in Portland. I was still DJing. I had an excellent record collection, like fantastic. I used to drive to Los Angeles from Las Vegas to go to record conventions, all of that. And when I became a monk, I wanted to own nothing. And so I took this record collection. I sold it for way less than I should have to a very nice guy who still has a Mississippi Records in Portland. His name's Eric. He still remembers the story because we have lamented it since. And from here, I feel like that was unnecessary. But for that person who was becoming a monk, it was really necessary to enter it, it really wholeheartedly. And it meant not owning anything. Um, some of those records are thousand dollar records now. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the and they're, and they're beautiful. It's beautiful music. And there's from this seat, um, there's no such thing as possession. Nobody owns anything. There isn't actually object permanence is suspicious. Huh. So the belief that we have to move these things that don't actually exist in order to be spiritually pure is really silly. Mm. But um, that young guy felt that he had to. So mm. 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 yeah, I, I appreciate the way you put that both that uh, I think it's really easy to look at these choices, and I say this from experience, and looking in my own mind and my own life story, it's really easy to weigh too heavily on one or the other. Oh, the past was right, or oh, the past was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. And uh, I appreciated the nuance of both. He really needed that. That was what he had to do at that time. And I would not do that again now. I don't see it as necessary. It was silly. Yeah. Uh -huh. One of the things my teacher, my teacher Hogan Roshi says, I really appreciate is he's like, all of our previous practice delivered us to this present moment. Mm -hmm. So how could it be a mistake? Mm -hmm. Like my, my now embracing these things from my renunciate point of view, it's kind of like, oh, you fell off. Mm -hmm. Like you're not a real practitioner. If you were a real practitioner, you wouldn't even have a record player. Oh gosh! Like that part of me, right? You could feel that. Yeah, I could. That's a little part work right there. Yeah, a lot you of could feel me feeling it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I am now, after a lot of practice, embracing that. And how could that be delusion? Right? It's just, it's just our, our minds, our minds uh, encompass. And we, we, we encompass. Uh, you know, the way they put this in Tibetan Buddhism is even if you're practicing Tantra or Vajrayana, where there's a more free relationship with phenomena, you don't abandon discipline. It's your foundation. But you, 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 you build on it. And, I, and I'm not saying that's the ultimate truth of Dharma, that way of looking at things, but it resonates. That it's important to know renunciation and what that does and what that catalyzes and that I don't need a record collection to be happy. And actually having done that, now coming back to it, the relationship really is different. Mm. Yeah. 
It's like having put aside um, relationship and spent some time celibate. When I re-entered relationship, it was different. Mm. Sexuality was different. Mm. I had a perspective on it I didn't have access to before. Mm. So, mm. But, but I have a lot of records. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I heard it again in your voice. <laughs> uh, uh, For a while, I was doing um, a listening meditation in Portland. Uh huh. Huh. And that was the time I that was the time I felt best about it because I was really sharing it. Uh huh. Yeah. Do you share your music in any way now? I don't. Mm. I haven't. I haven't. Um, no. Mm. Mm. It's it's really at this point it's a personal pleasure. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I mean. I mean, if you lived in my neighborhood and you wanted to come over and listen to music, of course, mm -hmm. right? But not in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of work to do that particular thing I was doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People can listen to it if they if they want. You can find me on Mixcloud under Beyond J. Yeah. Mm. I'm reminded of, uh, so I use Twitter quite a lot, and uh, I have a thread on there about I framed it in a very specific way, sort of sort of a self-deprecating way. I wanted to frame it in a self-deprecating way to make it clear that I was not taking this thread too seriously and that people reading it shouldn't either. I don't know how clearly that came through, but in any case, mm -hmm. uh, that was the intent. And this thread is uh, describing different models of awakening that I've come across that are just in my mind, like conceptual models of what awakening is. and. Yeah. Uh, which which is already suspicious, right? Uh, mm -hmm. By some of them, anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I'm reminded, in particular, of um, uh, how to put it. I, I think the one of the models that I'm most interested in at this time for people is um, uh, what I might call vitality. Whether someone is really like that there, there's the seed of who someone is and whether that's exploding right and and under that that view uh to me it's like to the extent that i know you uh which you know we've just met and are having this is our first conversation but um to the extent that i know you like it seems to me that that vitality of who you are would not be alive without music expressing itself in some way and from that perspective like of course you should have a record collection like duh that's how you come to life uh so i'm i'm glad that you have a record collection currently thank you i appreciate hearing that yeah. no truly that felt affirmative mm. Mm -hmm. yeah mm. I, could i speculate something this is personal i don't know you're welcome to okay i am wondering in the back of my head uh i i wonder if that critic will resolve when you do begin to share your music again in some way? It, you know, it was, yes. When I was doing Beyond the Sound and when I was accumulating records and capes with the intent of inviting people into a sound samadhi, mm -hmm. it was very much bodhicitta. So you're, I think you're spot on with that. And that's what a DJ is anyway. A DJ is someone who loves music and wants to share it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so at this point, it's not being expressed. And so I think there is a little bit of that kind of, mm. yeah. Well, and to add a sweet, a, a layer of sugar to this little bit of spiciness I've injected in the conversation. <laughs> uh, if I had to guess, you haven't, I mean, you said it was a lot of work to do it the way you did it before. And I bet that there's a more natural way to do it or some piece that's missing that you have yet to find or something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you and I talked again in five years and there was some missing puzzle piece that came in and then this expressed itself and then the critic resolved. And I, 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 and I think the reason I'm saying this, just to be fully honest, is I can really feel it when that comes through in your voice. It's like, oh, oh, he's, yeah, I experience it as you hurting yourself when you say it that way. And it's like, please don't do that. That's beautiful that you love music so much, you know? Oh, thanks. That's good feedback. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the iteration I worked with before was two turntables, two cassette decks, Ooh. and some electronics. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. And so practically, it was a lot to, to manage and a lot of setup. It was definitely a labor of love. Yes, yes. I've, I, I mean, here we are having this conversation where I hit record on Zoom and hit stop. So I've had to find things for myself that, uh, you know, are just, you know, uh, easy to do. So, uh, yeah. Mm. 
Well, I appreciate you. The, the reason I'm leaning into this is uh, even though we've just met, uh, like I have the feeling of you deserve my fullest friendship and that's why I'm Aww. speaking in this way. So uh, <laughs> even though I wouldn't normally do that when I just met someone, but yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think we have a lot in common. Yes. Uh, is there anything else uh, that you'd like to say more about or converse more about? Hmm. Um... I don't know, we covered a lot of bases. Yeah, well, I would just encourage anybody who is interested in, in the work that I talked about just to reach out. Hmm. And um, especially people who I feel are dedicated practitioners, I don't let the, the money be too big of an obstacle hmm. as far as one-on-one uh, -on -one work with me. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in parts work or meditation coaching, guidance in your practice. And then I teach Zen uh, online every Wednesday through Zen Community of Oregon. Hmm. And I still do retreats with them. So if you're interested in, in just like my flavor of teaching meditation, you can drop into that anytime. Hmm. It's on uh, Wednesday evenings at six, six o'clock Pacific. Hmm. Hmm. And yeah, it'd be wonderful if, if some, some folks just dropped in and got a, got a sense of how we do things in that space. Hmm. Beautiful. I'm glad you've mentioned these things and sort of left breadcrumbs for people to follow with the different things you've mentioned. And uh, thank you overall for just really sharing yourself in this conversation. It's it's beautiful to witness who you are. So thank you for being oh, so vulnerable. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm.